All right. Okay, I'm going to turn the music on. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, I don't think we're going to finish this evening, but probably Wednesday uh, we'll, we will finish with our, our uh, discussion on Theodore Roosevelt. But, but uh, there's still a lot more for us to cover, and I hope you will all join in with questions and comments. Uh, we left off with uh, this slide with Theodore Roosevelt ending his second term in March of 1909. And he honored the tradition by not seeking a third term, uh, but he persuaded William Howard Taft, who was his close friend, uh, to head the Republican party ticket. And they went up against William Jennings Bryan, who was his Democratic party opponent. Uh, and for, for just some additional insight, um, the uh, the public, edited by Lewis F. Post, was very much in support of William Jennings Bryan for any number of reasons. But Taft won with 51.6% of the vote uh, and became president of the United States. The public reported on all of Bryan's activities in every weekly issue. And, and as I said, most single taxers supported his candidacy, even though, uh, as an editorial I'm going to show you after the election, indicated that, that William Jennings Bryan actually disappointed a lot of them on what to do about the economy. This, so despite all of the connection that Bryan had with the leaders of the single tax movement, he still wasn't willing to stand up for the kind of reforms that the single taxers were asking for. And here's what the public had to say. His single tax supporters have not been unmindful of the fallibility of his economic judgments and the shallowness of his proposed remedies. The trust plank in the Denver platform said to have been dictated by Mr. Bryan is of all remedies the most preposterous and it was upon this most vulnerable part of his armor that Governor Hughes, who on the Republican side made the most effective speeches in his campaign, directed his heaviest artillery. And he adds, this is Louis Post, I think wrote these editorials, and he adds, repeated efforts have been made to draw Mr. Bryant out with some expression of opinion on the right of every man to use to the use of the earth without which the discussion of any economic problem is waste of effort. And they were not successful. So now they had to deal with uh, William, with uh, uh, Taft as president. Well, what happened to Theodore? Well, almost immediately, he leaves the country for a long hunting trip in Africa. And then he toured Europe pretty extensively before returning to the United States. Um, he made his way to England during the spring of 1910, where he met with leaders of the Liberal Party, including Lloyd George, Henry Ashquith, and Edward Gray. And while he was there, Lloyd George discussed with Roosevelt the objectives behind the people's budget of 1909, over which the liberals and conservatives were deeply divided. Um, and in the people's budget, of course, was the 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 proposition of at least assessing land values with the possibility of, of imposing a land value tax in Britain. An English single taxer named John Bagot summarized the situation in Britain in an article that appeared in the November-December 1909 issue of the single taxer. And here's what he had to say about the situation in Britain. The other day, Josiah Wedgwood promoted a member's petition to the government asking them to tax land values in their next budget, and this was signed by 245 members of the House of Commons, including almost all the Labor members. Of those 245 members, if those, two, those 245 members have backbone, Josiah has, 
the government will be as potter's clay in their hands. And he goes on to say, this great work can be accomplished without allying ourselves with any party. Indeed, that is the only way in which it can be accomplished. It cannot be obtained by stealth, smuggled through incidentally in some omnibus bill promoted by a political caucus. It is the greatest reform of modern times, and as such, must be fought for as a distinct issue. I think this is worthy of asking you to react to, um, because you know, in every country where where there's been an effort to try to get legislate legislatures to adopt um, a bill that would enable the single tax, it hasn't worked. Um, and appealing to one party or the other hasn't particularly hasn't worked particularly well. There's always been a few on the liberal side and a few on the conservative side who thought it's a good idea, but never with enough muscle to get any legislation passed. So what do you think about what uh, Pago here says about uh, having to do it without allowing ourselves with any political party. Any thoughts? Marty. Yeah, I figured I'd uh, <clears throat> pitch in there. Um, well, yeah, I think it's got to be straightforward. And I, I brought up last week situation in Detroit, and I think they're going about it in a, in a good way in terms of making the case to the people who are going to benefit and have that be a groundswell rather than the other way around. Because just like the Robert Menendez case, uh, you know, we don't all have gold bars to give to politicians. So um, I, I think um, you just have to appeal to the people who are going to benefit. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, we just have to elect people that are going to do the right thing. Yeah, I, I reminded of the campaign that brought the two-rate property tax to Allentown, Pennsylvania, that it really uh, was was an effort, successful effort to reach out to the general public. Um, and that campaign required a lot of effort, a lot of telephone calls and and public support, but it but it worked. Um, Michael, how are you this evening? I'm I'm fine. I'm just going to read you a little paragraph from a book I'm reading. It's called, it's about Tolstoy, Principles of, for a New World Order. And it, it, it and a lot about Henry George in that. And this paragraph struck me the other day when I was reading it. And this is Tolstoy speaking. I think that a great deal of the evil of the world is due to our wishing to see the realisation of what we are striving at but are not yet ready for, and our being therefore satisfied with the semblance of what of that which should be. We are so created that we cannot become perfect either by one or by one, either one by one or in groups, but from the very nature of the case, only all together. I think that sums up for me really the the, the challenge Different different groups uh, advocate different economic reasons, but and, and you can wish it devoutly, like the Georgists or you know us in various ways uh, are are looking towards some real reform that we think is important. But until you get everyone doing it, 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 it seems to fall by the wayside, and that's the challenge, I think. And, and it's also a challenge because those of us who who studied Henry George's writings um, and written ourselves about them, we tend to think that we have the truth, exactly. we have the solution. Yeah. And and everyone else who's working on these issues think that they have the truth, that they have the solution. Um, here in the United States, I listen quite often to a an economics professor who is a Marxist and a socialist uh, named Richard Wolff. And he has a very large following uh, of people on the left. And a lot of what he says, I absolutely 100% agree with. 
Um, he does have a an appreciation for the land problem, but mm. he doesn't see it as systemic. He see it. He sees it sort of as um, one small piece of the puzzle, and you know, winning someone like that over who has such a strong constituency would be a great uh, step forward. I think. I don't know how we, we, we do that, those of us who are advocates, but um, but hopefully we find some some leaders who already have a strong following. And if they say, you know, I have I have thought through these problems seriously and fundamentally we, we must solve the land problem, we're not going to be able to solve any problem. Yeah. Well, it, well this is the dilemma. With Tolstoy, really, and and Henry George, uh, you know, they had this correspondence. They never actually met, but it's I, I found it very interesting. This little book is published in 1993, and I'm reading it because we've that, got is that David Redfern's book? Yes. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, excellent book. Yeah. Uh, Jim Fredrickson, I see you got your hand up. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, I appreciate. Uh, all that you've done in making these presentations about uh, TR. The question is, have you talked to Mr. Wolf, the professor you you cited, and asked him whether he would be in favor of socializing ground rent? Um, I have not been able to talk to him directly. However, he was interviewed by Andrew Mazzoni some years ago for the Henry George School's Smart Talk program. And that interview is still available uh, on YouTube and it's probably available directly on the school's website as well. And he does speak favorably about land value taxation, but again, um, I don't see, I don't think he sees it as a systemic reform. He sees it as an incremental step in the right direction but we've tried, uh, we've tried to invite him to come back uh, to to the Smart Talk program, so I could interview him and I could put those questions to him more directly. We'll see if he if he's ever going to be available to uh, accept our invitation. I'd love to know what his response was uh, would be. Uh, well, you can go out and look at the at the interview at the Smart Talk interview. Okay. I think it was done in. 2014, if I'm not mistaken. So, Marty, uh, you had another comment? Yeah. Uh, you know, one technique would be to find somebody who you kind of agree with, but somebody who uh, uh, opposes a lot of what um, uh, Mr. Wolf says, so that he would be obligated to come back to defend himself. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I'll leave that up to someone else to ta to tackle. Okay, uh, I'd like to have a pleasant conversation with him because I think many of his ideas are on the right path. Particularly his emphasis on on cooperative enterprise and worker democracy. I think yeah, those I those initiatives have you know a lot of of uh, merit, and they are systemic as well. Yeah, I attended uh, several of his classes and I'm always frustrated because he never answered questions from the uh, audience. Oh. So I just stopped going. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe one, there are, Richard Wolf is just one person and there are many others, you know, who who uh, have constituencies and and whether they're academic or political or activist. And so, you know, what hopefully is that the time for for clear thinking may have finally re arrived. That the challenges that Theodore Roosevelt and his generation faced are repeating, and you know I think that's what our this series of lectures on Roosevelt and his era are showing. That you know the more things change, the more they remain the same. That we're facing the same sort of challenges, maybe just even at a deeper level. 
more difficult to, to respond to than they were even his, in his time. And Roosevelt's own thinking was really evolving. Uh, actually, on the trip back to the United States, he read this book by Herbert Crowley titled The Promise of American Life. And this had a very immediate impact on him. It was from Crowley that Roosevelt adopted the phrase, the new nationalism. And so this became his mantra now for what ought to happen in the United States in terms of its domestic policy and the nation's interaction with other countries. Now, at the time, back in the United States, the most pressing domestic issue was actually the fate of the nation's monetary system. The Aldrich Monetary Commission was ready to propose creation of a central bank to take responsibility for manage the money supply and regulating nationally chartered banks. Um, there were still a lot of issues to be resolved, but the lessons of the 1907 panic were, were clear to many. At least they, they thought they had a clear idea of what caused the panic. They understood the nation needed a stable money supply, and the legislation would be signed in 1913 by President Wilson, creating the Federal Reserve System, which, as I assume most Americans know, and maybe Michael, you know as well, is a system of private central banks. The Federal Reserve System in the United States is not a government central bank. It's a system of private central banks with its operations overseen by the government. And that's had a lot of uh, consequences over, over the decades. Well, with, with, with the Federal Reserve System coming up, the question is going to be, well, you know, what should we expect of the Federal Reserve System? How much power should it have? Meanwhile, in the United States, progressives were coming together in order to make William Howard Taft a one-term president. There was a national meeting of the dissidents that was held in January of 1911, uh, which led to the creation of the National Progressive Republican League. And this group backed Senator Robert La Follette of Wisconsin as their candidate in the 1912 presidential race. Um, as for Roosevelt, uh, his biographer, George Mowry, explains the position in which he found himself. He writes, Roosevelt was on trial before the progressives of the country. If Roosevelt produced a program of concrete remedies for the present evils, he might capture the Republican nomination. So this is a, a time when the, the, the nation is feeling very much at risk. The in, there's instability. The panic of 1907 is still making its way through through the economy. Uh, there are still, you know, many people who are unemployed. There are still bankruptcies, foreclosures, and all of that activity going on, very much like 2023, as a continued outcome of failing to make the systemic reforms that were required after 2008. In June of 1910, a meeting was held in St. Paul, Minnesota, where the first discussion occurred regarding uh, the possibility of creating a new third party. Uh, sorry, I forgot to advance that slide. Um, uh, Mallory explains just how risky this would be to Roosevelt to publicly oppose Taft on uh, alienate close friends and probably contribute to victory for the Democratic Party candidate. Yet, uh, Roosevelt was becoming increasingly frustrated by Taft's decisions and the policy directions that were being taken by the administration. Again, this is even though Taft was Roosevelt's chosen successor. So Taft is in office and he's showing himself to be much less of a progressive than Roosevelt expected him to be based on you know what apparent, apparently they had discussed about what the what the party should be doing once he's in office. 
Mallory says this, Roosevelt came home thoroughly convinced that Taft, though sincere, had permitted reactionary forces to lead him into a position that had inevitably occasioned the revolt of the progressive faction. Conferences with progressive leaders sustained that judgment. And he adds this. Roosevelt was condemning his successor not for being a conservative, but rather for not being a politician. Distraught as he was over the state of the party, Roosevelt determined to devote the summer to bringing the two wings together. He made it clear after repeated calls for help from both sides in the primary fights that he intended to eschew all factional struggles. Through conferences and letters, he argued Gifford Pinchot out of his desire to form a new third party. So it's uh, Roosevelt is still not sure that he cannot turn the Republicans around to get behind a progressive uh, set of policies. So now what, what's he decide to do? He goes on tour for the West, throughout the Western state, states uh, where he's delivering addresses to large crowds, explaining to his fellow Americans what his principles of new nationalism would mean to their daily lives. And Marty, here's where you take over yeah. for the next two slides. Yeah. Uh, the man who wrongly holds that every human right is secondary to his profit must now give way to the advocate of human welfare, who rightly maintains that every man holds his property subject to the general right of the community to regulate its use to whatever degree the public welfare may require it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, this is the only, only quote uh, right now. So read that again, because I want everybody to, to, to think about this more deeply. That's got a, a George's ting, tinge to it, I guess. Maybe. Yes. The, the man who wrongly holds that every human right is secondary to his profit must now give way to the advocate of human welfare, who rightly maintains that every man holds his property subject to the general right of the community to regulate its use to whatever degree the public welfare may require it. This is a really strong statement, don't you think? Uh, um, this is still um, the era of unbridled individualism mm -hmm. with, with the progressive movement trying to impact that, fighting corruption, fighting privilege. And now this is a direct statement that suggests that the right to property is sub subservient to the public welfare. And the question is, what kind of law would, would Roosevelt support? What kind of law should the political party support in order to make that happen? Well, one of the problems that was occurring at, at, at this point is inflation and the cost of food you know, it was a real problem for, for a lot of lower income households as it is today. So in an effort to bring down the cost of food and also to stimulate exports of manufactured goods, Taft agreed to reduce tariffs on goods coming from Canada, conditioned on reciprocity by the Canadians. This is not free trade, but it is, again, using the tariff uh, in a way that that hopefully will be mutually beneficial and would accomplish some sort of political objective. You know, um, I once read that unemployment does not lose a president re-election. What loses a president re-election is inflation. And there's some logic behind that because unemployed people tend not to vote because they're so frustrated and you know don't feel like there is anything they can do to change things but people who are absorbing higher costs are angry and the and the the solution to that anger is kick out the current people and bring in some new people well progressives oppose the agreement because they believed it would harm farmers bring down the cost of food that means bring that bringing down the cost the revenue that farmers are obtain, obtaining. Now, there's no discussion here about the fact that 
farmers had uh, begun to acquire land on credit. And so they have to service that debt. And in order to service that debt, they need higher commodity prices. So you reduce the cost of food, reduce the revenue to farmers, and what happens to the debt that they have incurred as they've been expanding their acreage and they've been applying more fertilizer and machinery, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it's a complex, you know, uh, economic issue with a lot of po possible negative outcomes for certain segments of the population. So you're a politician, what do you do? Well, also many people in Canada also saw the agreement as harmful to segments of the Canadian economy. So what happens? The bill passes in the United States Congress, but the Canadians veto it. So we're back to square one in, term, in terms of what to do about the tariff. Well, the split between the progressives and the conservatives within the Republican Party continued to grow during the two years that led up to the 1912 presidential election. Um, Roosevelt remained in the background, doubtful the party could retain the presidency. His biographer, Mallory, tells us that Roosevelt was set to work after the election to rebuild the party. Mallory says, when everything was weighed in the balance, the views of the conservatives, Roosevelt felt, were not quite as erroneous as those of the radicals. As for the ultra-radicals, who sought to defeat Taft for the renomination, they were traveling the road toward the company of single taxers and pro business. How terrible that would be, right? The right thing to do was to renominate Taft and face defeat and then reorganize under some progressive leadership. Um, so Roosevelt is thinking now ahead, accepting the fact that probably. Uh, the Democrats are going to gain the election. He returned to politics, however, pretty quickly. Whoops. Uh, he first challenged William Howard Taft for the Republican Party nomination. Uh, Taft began to fight back, referring to Roosevelt's theories of government as, quote, crude and even, quote, revolutionary. He also accused Roosevelt of stirring up class hatred. So here we are, two friends uh, going not head to head, but back to back and, and uh, fighting against each other. During 1911, Roosevelt gained a lot of state delegates. Um, this is a photograph of the convention, which prompted a lot more strident attacks on him by Taft and, and Taft supporters. Roosevelt's nomination strengthened with a victory in Ohio and then New Jersey as well. So he's getting more and more delegates. However, the way candidates were chosen was not really based on who won the most delegates at open primaries. So the National Republican Committee had the deciding uh, uh, vote and uh, George Mowry makes note of the fact that, quote, its members had been chosen from loyal Taft supporters. So in the end, Taft secured the nomination by manipulation. This is probably, if you think about it, um, it continued for a long time until the uh, election, I guess, of, was it 68 um, in the United States when the uh, parties voted for open primaries? Uh, somebody maybe correct me on that if I'm not, if it wasn't 68, it was 72 when we for, we got open primaries. And there's been a lot of discussion whether or not that was the best thing, because look at the candidates we've had for president and vice president ever since. Did we get the best candidates possible? Uh, maybe, maybe not. They've got the most, they got the most uh, delegates and they got, they were, they got the nomination, but when we had uh, smoke-filled rooms choosing the candidates, maybe from time to time they would be better or worse. Who knows? I don't know if anybody has a has an opinion on open primaries or not, but that's just one of the 
the outcomes of, of open primaries. So we, we've gotten candidates by popularity and not necessarily on the basis of number one, were they really true to the party's principles? Would they follow through on the platform? And were they reliable? Jim, uh, oh, you're clapping. <laughs> oh, but sorry. Wh why are you clapping? I didn't mean to clap. I meant to raise my hand. Sorry. There we go. Um, the One of the problems with open primaries is they are held in the United States is the fact that uh, they're, hold over, they're held over a six-month or so period. Right. Uh, it would be interesting to have a constitutional amendment that says all votes cast for president during primaries will be impounded until all votes have been cast. Nobody knows in state two or state three how the voters in state one voted until all the votes have been cast so that no candidate can use the result of a of another state's primary and say to the voters in state two, look at how well I did in state one. I'm sure you agree with them and must want, want to vote for me because nobody will know what the result in state one is until all the primaries are over. Yeah, yeah, well, isn't there, there's a fight going on right now uh, between uh, New Hampshire and what is it? Which other Iowa. state is it? Iowa, yeah. Uh, I mean, as soon as somebody said they wanted to have their primary earlier, uh, I, uh, New Hampshire says, we want to be first. Well, Iowa and New Hampshire can be first all they want, but if their votes are not made public, then being first is not have the same advantage that it otherwise would have. That's a minority you know, can... view, I, I, I know, but that's, I think that would be, uh, that would be a way to have, to add fairness to the primary system. Well, if you could guarantee that the results would not leak out. <laughs> well, it depends it's... on who's charged with guarding the results. Yeah. Yeah. W.E. Perry. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and, and by the way, what what is your first name? Walter. Walter. Okay. Walter, welcome. Thank What's you. What's on your um, mind? Well, first, uh, let me let me do this in reverse order. Quick correction of fact: the New York, the New Hampshire Constitution was amended to require that they hold the first primary in the nation. Um, and that became an issue only because having been resurrected from what would have been an inglorious exit in 2020 by South Carolina, uh, Joe Biden, through the Democrat National Committee, has colluded with Representative Jim Clyburn of South Carolina to see to it that South Carolina is the first primary acknowledged by the Democrat National Committee. Um, this has one and only one effect. It nullifies the fact that Robert Kennedy is going to win the New Hampshire primary, um, just as Gene McCarthy did in 1968. Now, I've got to give Bobby Kennedy real credit because he has more balls than his father. Um, his father did not challenge LBJ in the Democrat primaries until Gene McCarthy had won in New Hampshire, and then until after the Tet Offensive uh, in January and after McCarthy's victory in the New Hampshire primary in February, Johnson announced in March of 68 that he would not stand for re-election. And then and only then did Bobby Kennedy Sr. come forward with a challenge within his own party against the incumbent president. Um, Bobby Kennedy Jr., to his great credit, uh, has done it months in advance. Uh, but the facts there are exactly the same as they were in 1968. Um, I was a McCarthy supporter in those days. Um, I never thought I would see 1968 come back again. Um, but Joe Biden has made exactly the same mistake that Lyndon Johnson made, 
which is that you cannot have both social programs and a war simultaneously. Um, Franklin Roosevelt understood that. Uh, in his weekly news conference, the week after Pearl Harbor and the US declaration of war, he said to the reporters, well, boys, you've known me as um, uh, Dr. New Deal in the depression, but from today on, it's Dr. Win the War. And the social programs that had been the focus of the administration since 1933 were subordinated to the war effort. Uh, because Johnson was unwilling to do that from 65 on, he found himself in the impossible quagmire uh, of 1968 and had to drop out. Um, I suspect Joe Biden, by March of 2024, just like LBJ in March of 1968, will find himself in essentially identical cir circumstances. Um, the DNC, under Biden's leadership, will not acknowledge uh, a victory by anyone other than Biden in Iowa or New Hampshire unless it's by more than three quarters of the vote. Uh, that's the most astonishing piece of rigging I've seen in a lifetime in the Democrat party. But uh, anyway. It, it stands to, it stands to the reason that we're going to be in for quite an interesting and entertaining uh, presidential campaign on both sides. Okay, but let's let's go back to 1912. Um, you put up um, a slide of Nelson Aldrich. Uh, yeah. All right. Nelson and monetary reform being a main issue that had to had to be had to be resolved if uh, the either party was going to really remain in power. Well, actually, Nelson Aldrich was probably the greatest master of the false flag operation in English speaking politics since the time of Oliver Cromwell. And the three things that happened in 1911, 12, 13, which are of greatest significance for this country, uh, were all engineered by Nelson Aldrich as if he had nothing to do with them. Um, this includes the Federal Reserve System. This includes the 16th Amendment, creating the income tax, where he withdrew Republican opposition to allow the amendment to pass in Congress so that the question would be put to the states in ratification. Um, we'll come back to that in a second. Well, uh, yeah, I'd love to spend more time talking about this. There are a few other people who have have a comment. So, so okay. why, why hold you there? And if we have time, we'll come back to it. Uh, but I'll leave you with a question that you can respond to, and that is, from my reading of Carol Quigley, uh, Edward House was really the um, the inside man to get Wilson to sign the legislation to create the Federal Reserve. Uh, Aldrich, from my reading, did not have that kind of uh, influence over Wilson. But, oh, but I'll let, I'll it, let you it, it clarify that. It was an influence over Wilson that mattered. It's a cui bono analysis. Okay. Nelson Aldrich worked for his father-in-law, John D. Rockefeller. Right, right. And the three things that I've cited, the 16th Amendment, the 17th Amendment, and the Federal Reserve System all appeared to be contrary to the interest of John D. Rockefeller, but actually deeply served his interest. Essentially, after the imposition of the income tax, no one else was able to amass the fortune that, in the absence of income taxation, Rockefeller had been able to do until Bill Gates. Uh, and we can discuss what those problems are at another time and place. Okay. All right. Thanks for that, Walter. Joe Polito. 
Hello. Um, Good great. evening, Joe. How are you? I'm great. Uh, another great presentation. Um, I put in the chat a link to Eccles replying to Patman ah. about the ownership of the Fed. And I've heard an almost identical analysis given by Ronnie Phillips, who wrote the review of the Chicago plan in the 90s, <clears throat> which was also um, prefaced by... Um, Let me interrupt you for just a second. For those who don't know, Mariner Eccles was the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve um, <clears throat> from, what, 33 on until... 34, I think. 34 on. But he was a Mormon banker and uh, brought into Washington for consultation and end up getting appointed as chairman of the Federal Reserve. Go ahead, Joe. And in fact, uh, he's he also in 1939 produced a document about the household fallacy, uh, read it on radio, responding to the parallel uh, Freedom Caucus of that day, led by Byrd. And, uh, you know, the, his analysis sticks completely. The, the amount of economic ignorance by that caucus is just believable. The demand for a balanced budget and so forth. At any rate, um, I, Ronnie Phillips repeated almost the identical analysis that Eccles did about the Fed not really being private. I mean, it is definitely a hybrid. It's an odd duck. But it's often portrayed as a, you know, privatized and unique and the Eccles papers uh, responses part and very instructive. I have uh, his, I, I scanned his uh, biography beckoning frontiers and put it up on my website. So it's up online, but Eccles is quite the interesting uh, figure in all of this. And he had, he had a lot, a lot to say about the uh, full employment economic policy. Um, he's viewed as sort of a, uh, Pre-Keynesian, Keynesian in his analysis, uh, he's, he's some someone worthy worthy of uh, a lot more study. Brilliant man, and uh, the story there was he <clears throat> he he was a brilliant banker, a very successful banker, and an industrialist. He spoke at a bankers' conference in maybe thirty three or thirty two. Um, he was heard by somebody who knew somebody in the yeah. Senate, I think, and. They, they had him speak there, and within a year he was, uh, as you say, he was made chair. So he's obviously a brilliant individual. Tom Jacobson, I see you're you're enjoying yourself out of doors in the sunlight. So uh, uh, unmute yourself and, and join us. We cannot hear you. You're still muted. There you go. Oh, you, you you were you were you were unmuted for a second and you muted yourself again. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I just want to make a brief comment. Uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. is by no means uh, someone that could be compared to his father, Robert Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy Jr.'s uh, nomination. Uh, attempt to get uh, the presidency was fueled by his anti-vax position, and he's become the darling of the uh, conspirator uh, mega group, uh, QAnon, uh, all of the uh, anti-vaxxers. Um, I believe Biden, given all of the complex problems that he and has had to deal with has done a, a fabulous job for the uh, uh, American uh, people. And I, I don't believe that he's going to uh, drop out of the race. And I think the overriding issue in the race as it develops after the primaries and it's head to head Biden and uh, Trump, it's going to be whether you want to have a country that's a democracy or whether you want to have a country that's uh, going to be at best authoritarian and could very well drift into fascism. Those are those are really serious issues for us. I, I 
I mean, I have this, I have similar concerns, uh, whether, uh, whether we make it through this period, uh, without moving further towards uh, authoritarian domination in our political system is, is hard to predict. Um, uh, as for, as for Robert F. Kennedy Jr., I've listened to a good many of his speeches. Um, uh, in many respects, he sounds perfectly reasonable in, in his concerns and he's, but, but, uh, I really, I really haven't haven't spent enough time uh, listening to him on all the policy issues to make a judgment about whether or not I could support him. Um, but we're going to have again. It's I think it's going to be an interesting build up to the presidential election, and there's so many uh, variables going on right now. The question is, will people come out to vote? And what will their mood be when they come out to vote? Uh, will they will they be looking for something different uh, than what we have in terms of, of the mainstream pop, you know, pol par party politics? And will that choice mean that that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. will capture, uh, you know, a lot of Democratic votes as well as independent votes? Um, who will the Republicans put up? Will Donald Trump still be out of out of prison? Uh, and if he's and if he's convicted before the election, uh, who will the Republican candidate be? He's, we're in for some interesting times. I don't know whether they will have any positive outcomes for us as a nation, as a society, but. But I certainly share your concerns that <clears throat> we seem to be drifting from whatever the promise of democracy was, although I think we'd all agree it was never realized that we've always been far from the, you know, the real uh, promise that the that the founders thought that we were moving toward. But remember, they they were not in support of democracy at all either. They believed in meritocracy, and they also believed that there were some who were destined to rule and others who were destined to follow. Anything else? Anything else before we move on? I just want to cover a few more things before we, we close up tonight. Uh, but it's really appropriate, this, this conversation we've just had, it leads up to exactly what Theodore Roosevelt was doing. He was he was finally reaching that point where they decided to break off from the mainstream party and form the progressive Bull Moose Party. So what did that mean? It meant that Roosevelt now called for a program of a lot more government regulation over the economy and for an expanded system of social welfare. Um, that sounds not only progressive, but it sounds like he's moving, you know, in a in a leftward leaning position. Well, was he? Well, that that's the real question. If if he gets elected, what is he going to do? Um, he came out with this contract with the people, which is the platform of the party, um, and he was gambling. I think that progressive Republicans would leave to join him. Well, that didn't happen. Roosevelt campaign in support of systemic reforms that included, in political sense, direct election of U.S. senators, the initi initiative referendum and recall, women's suffrage, the regulation of interstate commerce, uh, creation of a federal securities commission, a simplification of the process of amending the Constitution, and a land monopoly tax. Uh, and with this list, he was really just getting started. So, it, you know, if in fact he had been elected, uh, the next decades of the United States uh, experience might have been very different if he had not only got elected, but if he had had the support in Congress. Well, Southern 
progressives were also divided because they were still driven by racial prejudice. They worried that Roosevelt would pursue policies securing greater political rights for persons of color. And on this issue, which I'll end with, um, Roosevelt equivocated. Marty, here's what he had to say. Again, I earnestly believe that by appealing to the best white men of the South and by frankly putting the movement into their hands from the outset, we shall create a situation by which the colored man of the South will ultimately get justice as it is not possible for them to get justice if we are to continue and perpetuate the current or the present conditions. So he's hoping that that things will ease off, but in the process, of course, he alienated black voters in the north. And so we leave we leave tonight with the fact that he didn't make it, and the results of the election were that Woodrow Wilson emerged with a strong majority. Uh, Roosevelt received about 700,000 votes, more votes than Taft, uh, which was probably at least some satisfaction. But now the Democrats are firmly in control, and uh, Woodrow Wilson is going to steer the, the country for the next uh four years at least. So with that, uh, I'll end tonight. Uh, Walter, did you want to come on and, and come back and, and add any additional comments to, to what we left with, with regard to, you know, the Federal Reserve System and its, and its origins? Well, it could be that. It could be the internal organization of the Democrat Party. It could be the problem of progressives in the South having to govern a black minority, which was not even acknowledged by the by the Northern parties, either Democrat or Republican, but we'll leave all those for a different time. Yeah, um, we, still, we still have that legacy, do we not? And, uh, and, and, and now we have new federalism, it's been in place ever since uh, Ronald Reagan was in the White House, and we we see the evidence of new federalism in its operation, you know, all the time with with our states now basically choosing which human rights should be treated under their own con state constitutions as human rights. We that seems to me to be one of the great problems in the United States today, that there is no consensus over what constitutes our, our human rights. Tom Rossman. Hey, Ed, great, great stuff. Um, I just wanted to mention to everyone, I put in the chat a, a, a link to uh, our upcoming, uh, the city of Tolosa, which is a, a new city built on George's principles. We're having a webinar on Thursday night. So if anyone can make it, um, we'd love to have you. It's about community and the power of community connections. So again, based on George's principles and, uh, you know, going to discuss how how we implement some of those things in, in the real world. So what time is that, that to begin? It's at seven, I believe. Eastern times. Yes, seven Eastern time. Thank you. Marty. So, uh, yeah, and to follow up on what Tom had to say earlier in that day at 9 a.m., I'm going to be speaking about Henry George to an international conference, uh, United Nations Science Summit. Uh, I'm on a panel with uh, several uh, Irishmen. Uh, I, in fact, I was invited to participate by a, an Irishman. Uh, but anyway, I thought there's a good opportunity because there's going to be a lot of international uh, attendees yeah. it'd be interesting to hear the kind of questions that they have essentially I'm uh, I'm promoting uh, uh, the ideas of uh, Henry George Eleanor Ostrom and and Kate Rayworth as a way of conceiving uh, 
the the way forward and uh, not to belittle Henry George, but actually to expand him. Well, so he's in fairly good company there with Kate. Yeah, so uh, it's going to be 9 a.m. I'm going to be speaking starting about uh, 9.30, 9.35. Uh, each of us have about 25 minutes to speak. And then there's going to be an hour-long Q&A. So it's a good time to start uh, coming up with questions. Are you going to put that, that link in the That's going to be online chat? or on sites? Yeah, it's online. So uh, go to uh, UNGA78. Huh. UNGA 78, which is the United Nations General Assembly, and put in Science Summit. And then if you put in the word defossilization, that's the topic that we're going to be speaking on. And you'll be able to find a session further down for July, July, for September 28th. I think it would be easier if you could share the link, Marty. Oh, uh, well, let's see. Do I have some time? Let me put that and in the chat. Send, send it to me and I will forward it to everyone. Okay. Yeah. Great. I'll do that. Yeah. yeah. Can you do the same with Joe? Joe's. Uh, okay. uh, Joe provided the link already. It's there. Yeah. yeah. But if you can you send that via email, though, uh, Ibrahima? It's uh, a yes. lot easier to Absolutely. keep track of. I'll do that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anything else before we break up tonight? Any other comments about the the, the road that R Roosevelt uh, took and his his commitments to uh, change the course of uh, history here? Well, we will finish up next week. I'm pretty sure uh, we should have a time for a good assessment of the. Uh, of Roosevelt's life and what he contributed and, you know, what he left us with, if, what, what's left over uh, from his legacy and, and how we should think about that. So until then, uh, uh, have a good night. I'll see you hopefully on Wednesday. Thank you very much, Ed, and thank you all. And uh, we will meet again on Wednesday. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Ed. Yeah.